USA to perhaps get themselves a consolation of some kind. And here's the chance, and what a finish! Well, there it is. Well, that's uh, certainly no more than they deserved. Again, England using the full width of the pitch. And they're in again, and how simple did that look? After a long, long wait, quick look up, and a first-time effort. There's Billy and Tully. Katan is two, goes to three. South Africa back into it, oh, and immediately it's Sato for South, sorry, for Argentina, and it's 4-2. It's the FIH Pro League show, um, and I'm joined today by show regular, Marsha Cox. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Trent. Brilliant to see you. Um, and we've got a debutante on the show, uh, Trent Mitten, Australian international, 181 caps for Australia, uh, a silver from Tokyo, a glittering international career, which he called time on just, uh, just a, a little while ago. So, um, hello, Trent. How are you? Going well. Thanks for having me on today. It's an absolute pleasure, and we hope to see your see your face on a regular basis. Um, we, we're gonna we're gonna keep it short and sweet today. We've got uh, we've got four matches to look at, um, and uh, they were the matches between Argentina and South Africa men, and the USA and England women. Um, Argentina uh, won the first match four um, three, and the second was drawn two two. But that is definitely not the whole story. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come to Marsha first. You know, she's smiling like a like a Cheshire cat. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to be you've got to be pleased with South Africa's performances in those two games. Do you want to just give me your thoughts on on those matches to start with? Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. I think also we called it last week and we said that uh, everybody should be prepared for a surprise. Um, it's a young team, and um, I think yeah, I'm extremely proud of the progress that they made from um, just over a month ago in South Africa to where they are now. I thought Argentina pressed them really well. I thought the um, the high press for Argentina definitely caught South Africa off guard in the first game, but they managed to fix it and and get it under control in the second game. So, yeah, I was really happy with with those results. Yeah, I mean, if if you look at um, South Africa's progress, as you say in the Pro League, uh, I think they started off their first two matches. It was a eleven one and a ten um, two, yeah. and yet their last few matches have been very very close. And finally, they get a point on the board, which is brilliant. And until those final minutes of the second match, it looked like they were getting three. Um, Trent, you you watched the games, or you you certainly got thoughts on the games. How, how did you see it panning out? And particularly, what did you think of the Argentina performance? Yeah, it was interesting. The I think you you spot on, Marsha. It's I think it's quite common these days that um, it's just experience playing international hockey and the more games these guys are going to get under the belt, um, the better it is for, for South Africans for sure. Um, in the lead up to the first goal, actually South Africa put on a pretty high press as well against the Argentinian, Argentinians um, and they had a couple of chances, a couple of chances, a couple of turnovers really up high on the field and then which led to that, that first goal they scored, which was really good. Um, Argentina's performance, yeah, it's interesting. Yes, they've got a, a younger team, um, but I think they'll be they'll be disappointed. Although they may have got away with the draw there, if I'm honest. I think um, South Africa probably deserved the win. Yeah, I mean the turning point in that game, the second match was probably the sending off of Matt um, Guys Brown, and I think people across the world watching that match. Uh, would have felt this agony. I mean, he, he looked absolutely distraught as, as he sat on the bench. Um, he has noticeably been missing the last few matches. So how important has he, I mean, we saw for it, but how important is he for the team, Marsha? Yeah, well, one of the, the greatest values I think that uh, most great teams have is that they have their penalty corner and they have a great goalkeeper. And that's what he brings to the South African team is the, the penalty corner. And you saw it in, in both games that... Yeah, it's, it's a value that South Africa, unfortunately, when he's not around, they they miss it a bit yeah. too much. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is a huge compliment to him, but it also means that they've got a little bit of more work to do um, for when he's not around. Um, and then, if you don't mind, I just want to also talk about the goalkeepers, because that's also something that I find really interesting with, with South Africa, and I don't know what uh, yeah, trends from your experience, and also men's hockey is different to women's hockey, of course, but in the South African team, I noticed that they're changing their keeper uh, almost every quarter which is great. And I think also given the experience that they had going into Tokyo where the second goalkeeper got injured in the final days of preparation, you want to make sure that you have like a broad selection and that everybody gets exposed. 
But I also find it interesting that you're starting to see a little bit consistency come in with some with one of the keepers maybe performing better than the other. And one of the things that I thought this weekend was, are they getting closer to the point of actually deciding on a, this is our number one keeper? And yeah, maybe also just a question to Trent, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think that that would be a move that they should make? Or do you think that they should carry on with the switching? Yeah, it's interesting, hey? Like there's a couple of ways I reckon the teams can go about it. You can just commit to one goalkeeper for a period of time and say, this is our number one, this is our number two, that's how it's going to be. Um, I've definitely been in teams where I've done both. And more recently with the Australian team, we had a couple of really talented goalkeepers in Andrew Charter and Tyler Lovell that for the longest period of time, they were as good as each other and we couldn't find a, a number one and a number two out, outright. So we were going quarter on, quarter on quarter. So they just switch. And yes, to give both players games and experience, but also how difficult that makes us to scout as well. For instance, you, teams would be looking at goalkeepers and say, oh, Andrew Charter does this when, when the ball comes along the baseline, et cetera. Tyler Lovell does this. So it makes it quite difficult for teams to, to, to scout us if they have a different goalkeeper each quarter. Whether that's what they're doing, I'm not sure. But um, it seems like they just need to get some games, in, in, especially in some new um, goalkeepers, because it's such a hard job and you just need experience. You need games under your belt to be a good goalkeeper. Can I just ask, Trent, is that a fourth generation of Mitten in the background I can hear there? Yeah, I think it is a fourth generation. I think she's... Uh, She's, she's a little bit hungry or maybe she's ready for a sleep. <laughs> I, I, think she, I think she wants to be on the hockey show. It's as simple yeah, as that. Maybe, um, maybe yeah. she does. Just, I, I know neither of you are keepers, but obviously, um, you know, you, you, you know goalkeepers and you chat to goalkeepers. Can, can I just ask, what are the goalkeepers, as far as you know, what are the goalkeepers' opinions of this? Because it must be, I've always thought it must be very, very difficult as a keeper to come into a game cold and to be straight up to the uh, pace of the action in a way that it's not so difficult for field players. So, you know, what, what, what do, goal, do, do goalkeepers like sharing I, the space? I think, I think they hate it. I think they absolutely <laughs> hate it. Um, absolutely. I think they want to be... Goalkeepers are such a, I know, I feel like it's an individual role in a team sport. Um, mm. It's such a unique role in the game we play that um, I think they want to be, they, obviously they want to play the whole game. They want to be the guy. Um, so um, I think understanding that for what we were doing, maybe it was the best thing for our group. Um, but yeah, I think if they had their opinion, they'd, they'd want to play the whole game for sure. Do you find they have a siege mentality? They sort of pal up together and hate you all as a result of that? Or, or, or are they in competition with each other? Yeah, um, definitely in competition with each other, and yeah. um, which I think breeds great performance. I mean, if they were, if they were so, so nice to, to each other, they'd never be as good as they, as they are. Mm. Um, but I think they, def they buddy up on the surface and they, they always seem to hate the strikers because we always want hitting the ball at them from about two, <laughs> two yards away. Yeah, exactly. Um, just your f final thoughts on, on these two teams before we move on to the women's match. Um, Marsha, we spoke at the beginning about how South Africa have progressed through the course of the Pro League. Um, but what do you think they now need to refine or to change to, to make that step that little bit further so that actually they turn these these close results and these draws into, into actual you know wins and points on the board? Well, I think that they definitely improved um, on their unforced uh, errors. Mm -hmm. If we look at in South Africa, we, we spoke about that a lot um, and we saw an improvement now. But I think there is still a lot of room for improvement. A lot of the times uh, when they had to absorb pressure was also just for not being able to retain possession. Um, so if they can improve on that um, and just stay, learn to stay calm, there's a saying that we used to sometimes have is um, play with with fire in your in your body and your movement, but with ice in your head. And yeah. I think that they need to to kind of learn to find that balance. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, that's probably applicable to the match we're going to talk about afterwards as well. But um, just before we move on to the women, um, Trent, you've, you, you know, you've played Argentina many, many times. Uh, most uh, lastly was at the uh, Tokyo Olympics. So I think you won 5-2. Um, the, obviously, there's a new a new group of players coming through. And I thought, um, I think it was Agostini yesterday who had the, the presence of mind to put that, that final penalty corner away. But um, Argentina as a team, I mean, where are they now in terms of, of, of world rank? I, I know where they are in world rankings, but how do they measure up against the top, top teams? Do you think they're, they're right back up there again? Uh, I think, especially with this group they had out there um, in the game, it's a, it looks like they're in a bit of a rebuild or they're trying to, to blood some players. Um, which is really, really common after an Olympic Games, of course. Um, but 
in my experience playing against Argentina, like they are never easy beats. They always do this sort of stuff in the last minute. Um, the guy who actually forced the corner, I thought did really, really well. Like he was really composed on the baseline. He could have easily had a shot or tried to hit it across, found the foot, um, obviously made the, made the two, two at the end. So um, very, very common for Argentina to come back right in the last minute, always find a way just to, to get the ball over the line. So um and yeah, I think they're they're always a team to watch, and they just need a couple um, experienced players back in that group. I think they'll be they'll be right back up there again. Mm. You just you just knew, didn't you? The last couple of minutes, you just knew they were going to get. Oh, that, you can see it garbage. coming. You can see it coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let's let's quickly turn our attention to the women then. So we had USA versus England, uh, two teams that know each other really really well, sitting in seventh and eighth in the Pro League at the minute. Um, both with less than great experience in the Pro League in recent matches, that's for sure. Um, up to this weekend, I mean, USA hadn't actually won a Pro League match since May 2019, and they hadn't won a point since, uh, I think, February 2020. Um, Marsha, your, your thoughts on, well, we'll go with the first game first, where um, USA seemed to be matching England in every single respect except putting the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, I thought it was um, a great step up in terms of their previous performance. We saw a very sort of young and, and perhaps naive uh, performance in their in their previous games, um, but definitely um, they they're learning fast how to adapt to the international um, pressure and pace of the, of the game. Um, yeah, I was really impressed with the way they matched England, and I thought that those were the moments in the circle, both in their defense and in the in the attacking circle, where um, that little bit of inexperience and and sometimes. Yeah, it's a bit harsh when you say naive, but it, it is a little bit where you, you make a sort of soft pass in in your defense out of the circle instead of knowing that you need to do it with conviction, you, you know, and that comes with, with experience. But those were some of the mistakes that I think were still evident in, in their performance, but still what a great improvement. Yeah, and I mean, they, they are a team that are just so willing to learn, aren't they? Because, you know, they, they, they learn within 24 hours, but they've also been learning over the past the past few weeks and months as well. Um, Trent, what, what, what were your thoughts on, well, I, I mean, the, the first match uh, that England won 3-1, what were your thoughts on the England performance in that? You know, it was sort of almost a, a relentless, steady wearing down, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think they, they caught, um, caught USA um, on the hop pretty early on with, with a couple of... Um, Sorry, at the start of the second half, they had a couple of goals just when maybe they weren't paying attention ready as they started the second half. Um, again, maybe maybe talking about that experience in um, in playing international hockey. Um, I think, yeah, I think England will be obviously happy with the win in the first game, um, disappointed with the draw, but then obviously shoot that win in the second. Um, but USA are interesting. Like they're, for instance, they in 2014 they had a really successful group. Um, maybe came fourth at the World Cup even, yeah. made the semi-finals. Yeah. Um, and they had some really talented players in that group. And I think during the last um, number of years, they've been rebuilding, rebuilding. And I think they've got a group now that, um, well, the results show themselves, especially against England, that they could actually threaten some teams. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult. I, sort of, you know, just, just talking to both of you, their situation is different to anything that either of you two know through your own national associations in that most, well, all of them are college students. Uh, you know you've only got them for a limited amount of time. You're unlikely to have 35-year-olds in the squad with heaps and heaps of experience. How do you turn that to your advantage? Because it's it's difficult, isn't it? When you when you put a team out where the only person nearing 100 caps, you've, you've only got one or two people nearing 100 caps, and you're playing a team with someone like Holly Pern webbin who has, has played hundreds and hundreds. How, how do you turn it to your advantage? Marsha, come to you first on that. Yeah. Well, I think... Um, one of the things that they do have that's a huge positive is that they have time together mm. um, and so when you're a young team that time together needs to be used to to your advantage and I think that that's what they need to focus on is that that's their strength is if they can be a team a unit that knows each other so well um, they'll be able to definitely compete with with some of the top nations um, and that's what they've done in the past uh, you know they they spent a lot of time because Trent spoke about their success in 2014, but it was on the back end of a really unsuccessful uh, London Olympics in 2012, mm. uh, where they played for, for last place. So, um, and then they, they definitely had a, a change in their focus of focusing on their quality time together and increasing their performance. 
Um, and I think that that is, is one of the things that they still have going for them. It's just a matter of how to use it to, to their advantage and make themselves that unit again. Um, yeah, but I think that they've got a lot of potential. They are young and they've just got to remember that, uh, you know, they've got to keep on their timeline. And if they uh, know what their goal is for the next five years, they don't need to rush into it. They just need to break into more competitions so that they can get that international experience. Sure. Um, Trent, taking that on board um, and seeing each experience as a learning experience, I mean, they would have had quite a, quite a sobering moment yesterday where we just watched the confidence drain out of the team in the last minutes of the second game. Uh, you know, they went from 2-0 up, but even when they were 2-0 up, you sensed that they were in panic mm. mode. How, 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 do you, how do you sort of snap a team out of that? Yeah, it just, it just takes time. And 2-0 in hockey is the worst scoreline um that you could that you can be for for an inexperienced team because you know when the other team gets one goal that they feel like they're really back in the game yeah. um so two nil is always such a dangerous scoreline um for an inexperienced team and um yeah you could sense it was going to happen um and unfortunately there yeah, the turnover in the pocket um led to two one and then obviously the the pc goal for the for the two two was somehow just found its way behind the goalkeeper that, that Holly was, was able to knock, out, knock over the goal line. Um, yeah. but, but even that being said, they had a chance at the end of the game to add a PC with, for 3-2 um, at the end of the game, which England yeah. defended well, or they missed the trap or, or, or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, they, they'd be upset, I think, from 2-0 up. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I was again, I was watching that game and I, I felt so much for them because... You know, you sort of want a team like USA to, to, to register a win just to give the young kids a, a real sort of sense of a, a boost. Uh, we had to say goodbye to Marsha, then she shot off. But I've just got a couple more questions for you, Trent, just to uh, sort of uh, more, more general questions, really, for people listening to this who've got a um, uh, sort of real interest in hockey. Um, we, we saw in all of those matches shifting momentum. You know, to start off with, it was uh, obviously Argentina who had the momentum, then then South Africa came back into it. And in the USA-England game, there were some very clear shifts in momentum. Um, I just wonder, as a team, what precipitates that? Is it is it, a, is it an action on the pitch? Is it um, a collective by the players? Is it conscious or subconscious? How, how do we, why do we see these shifts in momentum and how do you sort of channel them? Yeah, momentum is absolutely something that teams can work on and you have to be conscious of it if you want to be successful. Um, both sides of it, how to harness it when momentum is in your favour and how to keep it um, and also how to wrestle it back if perhaps the other team has momentum. And there's lots of different things you can do. And like, as an example, if you have momentum, it's crucial that you keep the ball. Don't let the other team get a sniff. Don't let them get counterattacks. Counter Don't let them get chances. Um, keep the ball, keep keep attacking um and then on the other side of that to try and get it back it's it's crucial that you get some stops you get a you get a penalty corner you um perhaps can delay the game a little bit to take to take the air out of the other team um naturally these days quarter times and half times are, are, are great momentum stoppers and they can work in your favor and against you um it's what's it's what's changed international hockey since cords have been brought in in that um playing for australia we could dominate teams for 15 to 15 to 20 minutes and then we knew we could score some goals and eventually we could run over the top of them these days the best players get a break after 15 minutes at, at most and even less so you, the momentum just dies out of the game um but it's something that it's it's learned and you have to you have to practice it and you have to recognize when it's going well and when it isn't going well is it i mean is, is it something that a captain or a senior member on the pitch will call you know you'll be like right okay lads this is time this is time for us to push now um it's, it's not something that just seeps through the squad it's something that's consciously you know talked about yeah definitely yeah. is and, and something that spoke about in in team meetings and something that um i think the very best teams in the world are are the very best at it and there's, there's a reason why they're successful in that recognizing um when it's not going well and and trying to get it back and and recognizing when when are the times are okay let's really attack now if momentum's with us let's let's keep it let's try and dominate 
Yeah, I mean, and it's fascinating to watch it happening. You know, sort of seeing the mm. the match uh, the match pan out. Um, brilliant. Okay, we it's, it's great talking to you about the, the these matches and, and getting your insight. Uh, we've got another set of matches coming up in just over a week's time, uh, where Germany men and women take on England men and women. Uh, it's an age old fixture. What what are your thoughts ahead of that? Are we going to first of all? Do you think uh, now, sort of looking at the coaches' mindsets, we're going to see the top top players, or are coaches still tweaking and and uh, looking at introducing younger players into the squads yeah it's interesting i think um definitely in the men's side germany have over the last little period especially this season's pro league been been playing some younger players um a little bit of that had to do with different fixturing around german national competition and ehl that was on last weekend and that sort of stuff um but the game being in munich and gladback i wouldn't be surprised if a couple of the bigger names come back for germany um and play and especially um England are a strong team at the moment. Like if they if they put an inexperienced team out there, they they could have a pretty tough day. So I wouldn't be surprised if some bigger names come back in, on the men's side of things. Mm. And of course, as well, I mean, all four teams have got relatively new coaches, so that's quite exciting as well to see what they're going to do. Um, brilliant! Thank you so much, and and uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Hopefully, you'll be a, a regular on the show. Uh, we're we're going to leave um, the audience with with some of the uh, highlights from the weekend. But uh, thank you, Trent. Thank you uh, to Marsha, who, as I say, has now left. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. Thanks, guys. And England win it back again. Here's Hunt. Surely now. And there it is. England do grab a goal in this one. That will be annoying for Greg Drake. Coughing up possession once again. And this time England made them pay. Holly Hunt gets the ball across and set things in motion. In it comes. And it's an easy tap in. Well, she made the initial save. Kelsey Robe, Robe or, or rather Kelsey Bean. But you won't score a more easy goal than that.